Right. And do you do you perceive archetypes and the darkotypes as um having like a an external reality or are they purely psychological? Oh, they definitely have an external reality, like literally in the material world. Uh, mm. Like I mentioned with the protons and electrons, right? They have a physical form. And this is uh, one of the things I mentioned in the book, like with the doubles even, uh, there was a lot of people or several at least, I don't know about a lot, that saw and witnessed the double of Percy Shelley, for example, the poet. Mm. Uh, right before he passed away it was a physical manifestation or a vision that they could see with their eyeballs right mm -hmm. so these these things are not just metaphorical or psychological they're they exist in physical nature and i do mention in the book too that shadows also are physically real right so we right you can see them at the eclipses and every single planet that is in, you know, in our solar system casts a shadow because of the sun. And it literally casts a shot, a measurable shadow onto the earth. Well, greetings, my friends. I hope you're all doing well. My next guest is Maja de Oust, the white witch of Los Angeles. With degrees in biochemistry and transformational psychology, she has been writing, teaching, and consulting on astrology, tarot, and various other forms of esotericism for many years now. And she has written several books on these subjects, and she has produced her own tarot deck called The White Witch Tarot. And today, we discuss her latest book, Astrology of the Shadow Self, which combines shadow work psychology and astrology in a way that I have personally never seen done before. Imaja is a real pleasure to talk to. She just gives off a very sweet and inspiring sort of energy. And in many ways, it might contrast with the seriousness of her work. But when I think of Maja, I think of the, the magician chapter in Meditations on the Tarot. In that chapter, the author prescribes that the proper way to go about esoteric study is with the serious playfulness of a child. Have you ever watch a child at play? They're very engrossed in what they're doing. They're very engaged in their imagination in the game at hand. And yet, they're having fun. They don't take it or themselves too seriously. The two things might seem like a contradiction, but they're really not. They're really two sides of the same coin. And that's how I think of uh, Maja. I think of her, I think of the, the magician chapter of Meditations on the Tarot. But... With no further ado, let's get on to this excellent conversation with Maja de Oust about her latest book, Astrology of the Shadow Self. Thank you, my friends. I hope you're all doing well. So, um, all right, you ready to get into this? I'm totally ready. I'm excited. Thank you for having me. Um, it looks from all your stuff that we're birds of a feather, so it should be fun. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad you And actually, I wanted to start out by saying... Um, in the beginning of your book, and it's a fascinating book, by the way, uh, in the first like 10 to 20 pages, you have this just this little observation where you talk about how just contemplating the uh, the planetary energies and all of these just energies that are within us, you know, that were microcosms, the simple contemplation of them is like elevating it like elevates our sense of our own grandeur of our own being. And um I love that because that's actually, that was the motivation for this channel. Like, Oh, uh, that's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, I don't have any answers to anything, but I believe that just the searching for answers itself mm. is restorative and um, kind of like empowering that word. It feels cheesy because that word's so overused nowadays, but it is, it's like empowering and restorative. It and, raises, um, it raises our awareness when we put our minds upon it. Yeah. Abs absolutely i agree so i just i love that and i wanted to uh to just say that real quick i guess oh i love it yay <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah so to start out for the listeners the viewers could you just share the the core thesis of um astrology of the shadow self absolutely i would be delighted to uh for astrology of the shadow self it came to me in a vision it was like 2017 i think and i wrote the book mostly in 2018 so it was a while ago oh wow you know pre 
disaster <laughs> or like escalation of disaster. I guess it's always <laughs> disaster. Uh, but I saw that I've been I've been studying alchemy for you know a couple decades, and I saw the chart that you could flip it and make a mirror version of it because I do a lot of divination with I Ching and tarot and there's all these reversals, right? And, and I do astrology reading so much. I probably looked at like thousands of charts. So I was just looking at all this and I was like, you can flip the chart and get that negative uh, version. And so from there, I was just like, this has all got to be written about and explored because I feel like it's really such a unique way to gain data about shadow energies in ourselves and in transits for like what times that we're in. So it's mostly just looking at a flipped astrological chart that provides an oppositional mirror for you to look at, to see all those things that maybe you don't like to think that you are, um, right. And confront negative energies to look into some of our, um, atavisms and instincts that connect us to nature, which of course can come out in all of these, uh, I guess, um, you know, people call them animalistic behaviors, but I just think that's funny because human beings are animals, you know? So, right, right. uh, I really wanted to place the nature uh, aspect of it to help people integrate these things. And we really cast hate and shame on all of our behaviors that come from these instincts. And I feel like it's not really helping anything. <laughs> and if we're going to make progress, we really have to start integrating these negative energies and kind of visions that we have of ourselves. Mm. Yeah. And it seems interesting to me that it, it like the idea uh, came to you because you have a background in astrology, but also in, I forget, it's transforma transformational therapy. I forget the exact terminology for it. Yeah, transformational psychology. Transformational yeah. psychology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it seems like it kind of, those two things kind of combine in this book. Well, because as you start, like as I was reading science, I got into alchemy and then from there learned about astrology. But as you learn about these things, you, of course, get exposed to consciousness studies. Right. So you through alchemy, I realized, wow, this is all like really consciousness stuff. And you start reading hermeticism and you learn that all is mind and things like that. So then I went into the transformational psychology and found that a lot of the psychologists were all studying astrology and, you know, all of the archetypal stuff and the myths, it's all really so intertwined. So mm. uh, I think a lot of people don't know that psychology had its origins uh, through all these people like Anton Mesmer, right? People that were in Vienna, which had all of the alchemical manuscripts in their library. Right. Yeah. And I love you. You talk about this explicit connection, this alchemical. Um, the book is primarily about astrology, but you, you like explicitly discuss alchemy as part of this process as well. And I'm much more like first, I guess, in alchemy than astrology. So I, I really appreciate that. I found it really fascinating. But could you um, explain to people a little bit, both from a personal perspective and a uh, astrological perspective, what the shadow is. Yes, there's uh, quite a few different definitions. So I encourage people to look it up. And certainly if you disagree with me, I always welcome disagreements. It makes for good dialogue. Uh, mm -hmm. And the whole book is about how important these oppositional uh, dialogues are. Like it's really important to go to both ends of the pole. So if you disagree with me, it's perfectly okay. Uh, to me, the shadow, because I do uh, witchcraft work, is uh, it can be several things. In Jungian psychology, they define it as like the hidden parts of ourselves or things we don't want to see. Instincts, right? Freud and Jung kind of go nuts on looking at libido and instincts and everything. Um, and that they have their certainly own libido shadows, as I mentioned in the book, uh, mm -hmm. of course, Carl Jung was accused of rape. A lot of people don't know about the Sabina Selren story, uh, although it was even made into a major motion picture. I think it had Michael Fassbinder, uh, starring mm -hmm. in it. So it was very fascinating, but 
psychologically, it's uh, these kind of instinctual parts of ourselves that we hide or we don't want to look at, right? Um, but then in paganism and witchcraft, the shadow is also, we literally have a double, like another part of ourselves that is an inversion or our not self, hmm. right? Which you think, right. this is very hard. I'm going to say it again. There is an I, right? We all know the I am material, very popular. Everyone loves the affirmations. Everyone loves positive thinking, right? New thought, very popular because it's so like, yay, we're the winner. But nobody really likes to think about the negating aspect of self, which is our destroyer, our not I. We have both an I and a not I. And if we're going to come into completion, we must acknowledge and discover our double, this is also called the shade in a lot of the pagan literature, uh, which is our underworld self. And this is in the majority of the myths. And so I'm always very shocked. And right now, certainly shadow uh, is very popular in social media. You'll see lots of people talking about it. There's all these shadow workbooks now, uh, mm -hmm. but they're all really approaching it from a Jungian psychotherapy perspective, rather than this very ancient concept of the double, uh, which I really wanted people to kind of raise into their awareness again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny when you use those examples, because I just talked to Gary Lockman um, about- I love him. Yeah, his his latest book is about Maurice Nicole, who was- um, are you familiar with Nicole? I'm very familiar. Yes, I've read. Yeah, I think you'll find the book very intriguing because Nicole, Gary got his hands on Nicole's actual journals. And, um, oh, wow. It, yeah, it turns out that Nicole had some very strange sexual um, secrets of his own. And so it's uh, it's just funny that you you mentioned that and because uh, I've got Nicole on my mind because I just talked to Gary. Uh -huh. and, uh, and I just it's read It's very the book. important. Like we really need to come confront these things. I feel like society mostly will blame the individual, right? We'll have all these scapegoats and we'll crucify everyone for indulging in these bad behaviors, which are seen as I tried really hard to illustrate in the book, they're seen in other species in nature and they exist on the planet earth. And so I feel like it's really a form of ignorance to try to blame and scapegoat individual human beings uh, for holding these behaviors. It's almost like blaming someone because they pee. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. it's dumb. <laughs> I, I had, uh, I was actually going to wait to ask this, but like in the beginning of the book, you discuss this about the, how important it is to not just resist nature because, um, it, it creates problems. And I think that goes to people like Maurice Nicole, who is, I, my impression was Maurice was repressing his sexuality so much that it was having negative consequences on him. But the question does come like, what are the far ranges of behavior to things that are just actually harmful and destructive to human beings? Like, um, I don't know how, how, how do you conceptualize that? If you're talking about somebody whose natural impulses are like actually harmful to other people. Oh no, there's, it's your destructive self. Right, right. Like to be very clear, it's destructive. Mm -hmm. So there's cre all we talk about is the creative. Like I mentioned, everybody loves talking about creatives, but we do neglect uh, to notice. And this is something I take very seriously because I have a lot of clients and I work with people with this a lot is that the majority of creatives are the ones that self-destruct uh, mm. through suicide. Uh, and even the most massive creative intellects, like in mathematics or science, highest rates of, of suicide other than veterans and Native Americans are in creatives and intellects, mm. right? So, I mean, we have to understand that the destructive self is here with us always. And so when people become polarize to one side and ignore the other or you know like like nicole maybe uh by completely like dissociating from that self that's the danger of when destroyer will take us over uh and these behaviors uh will be kind of like possessed or ridden by destructive forces which are very real in the universe like i don't Right. We don't need to extrapolate much. It's <laughs> like real destruction happens mm. like death is real. So there's going to be humans are going to hold those capacities for destruction. Absolutely. Right. And we do. We mm. totally do. Yes. Right. 
Yeah. Um, and you actually, the, uh, there's a term that you mentioned in the book and you, you only mentioned it a couple of times and, and maybe you meant to kind of playfully, I don't know how serious you were with it, but the term archetypes. Oh yeah. I, I came up with that. <laughs> well, as I was going, I was like, these aren't archetypes, they're archetypes. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I'm, actually, do you... I'm, I'm currently doing a shadow tarot deck and I'm calling them archetypes more in the, in the tarot, but it's, we have these archetypal figures that we're all very familiar with, but they each have a double just like we do. Right. So in hermeticism, I don't know if you've come across it, but if you read the ancient hermetic texts uh, that go through the Toth dialogues, uh, they say everything in the world is double, right? You, there's no one thing. Everything comes with like a pair or partner uh, that pole it's everything mm. is that dipole there's protons, there's electrons, right? There's everything goes into those oppositional things and they, ex they coexist uh, each one in order to balance that's nature, right? So right. yeah, it's, uh, it's something that I think a lot of people don't really think of because we think of ourselves as these individuals or uh, like in a vacuum, right? There's mm. just like the I, right? Yeah. Right. And do you do you perceive archetypes and the darkotypes as um having like a, an external reality or are they purely psychological? Oh, they definitely have an external reality, like literally in the material world. Uh, mm. Like I mentioned with the protons and electrons, right? They have a physical form. And this is uh, one of the things I mentioned in the book, like with the doubles, even uh, there was a lot of people or several at least I don't know about a lot that saw and witnessed the double of Percy Shelley for example the poet mm -hmm. uh, right before he passed away it was a physical manifestation or a vision that they could see with their eyeballs right mm -hmm. so these these things are not just metaphorical or psychological they're they exist in physical nature and I do mention in the book too that shadows also are physically real, right? So we, right. you can see them at the eclipses and every single planet that is in, you know, in our solar system casts a shadow because of the sun. And it literally casts a, sh a measurable shadow onto the earth. Uh, they call it an umbra. Um, like umbrella or shade, right? So mm -hmm. these shadows are, they're physical and very real. They're, so it's its not just poetic metaphor. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you, you, um, yeah, there was, a, I like the section in the book where you talk about some, there's some, I think it was a tribal group, but I'm not sure, but there was some culture who said that like humans have three souls. One of them is the, the shadow. One of them is the one that goes up into the afterlife. Yeah. I, I might get be getting the details wrong. But no, I, you're correct. It's from the Yakut uh, indigenous people. And that was from Mircha Eliad's book, uh, Shamanism and Ecstasy. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that was really interesting stuff. How much, how much do you think that re mirrors reality? I mean, in my personal experience, I have had vision quests where I ascend and descend. And so I felt like it was very accurate. Uh, but you have to, uh, I guess this might sound kind of weird to a lot of people, but in order to perceive some of those things, you have to be able to open your multidimensional perceptual abilities, right? See through different dimensions of space and time. So mm -hmm. If we're just kind of like, you know, looking with our regular eyes, we might not see things like that. But if we right. engage in techniques, some people may spontaneously uh, have this happen if they take certain psychedelics or power plants or engage in a spiritual practice where you're doing meditative techniques. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting stuff. The And you have shot your... Um... You wasn't you one of your your like thesis was on shamanism or something. Yeah, in uh, my my thesis for psychology was on the shamanic uh, practices that made the I Ching. Uh, but then I did I also studied with Dr. Kelvin DeWolf. He's a Mi'kmaq Native American shamanic practitioner, and so I learned a lot of techniques from him. More than I always tell people, like you can read stuff in a book, but like 
if you meet a teacher or a master, like there's no replacing it. Like I know we all have the internet now, but like if you imagine, imagine you read a book on Kung Fu Mm -hmm. or you go and you learn Kung Fu from Jackie Chan, like which one's going to be better? Which one is going to have more effect, right? So I do think it's really important as we uh, spiritually seek that we do uh, honor the individuals and the humans that are really lineage holders or embodying mastery of some of the techniques. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've experienced that very significantly in my own life like uh my my own interests really accelerated with a shaman which is why i i was uh thought to ask that but then um it has increased as i've more and more immersed myself in the in the world and um yeah there there really is no um there's no substitute for meeting people who are actually deeply committed to spirituality but especially for masters however you want to figure it like people who are yeah really at that higher level you know yeah it's really palpable and you can like it really takes i feel like it's almost like a you know a cheat if you don't expose yourself to someone who's holding that space because it all stays in your imaginal realm uh Mm -hmm. until you can have that physical experience like um you know one of the things kelvin says a lot is it's like imagine the ocean but then you go swimming, like there's two very different experiences, right? Right. Like you can't, yeah. there's no comparison. Yeah. And that's the perfect metaphor or analogy. I'm not sure which that would be, but it's the perfect one because um, like, as you go, as I go anyway, you try to learn more and more to remember, like these things are beyond logic. Like logic can be a tool to understand them a little bit, but at some point you have to accept that these things, they happen on a level we can't even fully intellectually understand. And that's hard to accept. It's hard for me. It is anyway. Maybe some people don't seem to care for me. It's a constant battle. Like I always two steps ahead. And then I start analyzing, you know, and start like trying to come up with a perfect schematic for things and take a step back. But, but anyway, back to your book. So the book is not only theory. Um, it's also, it's like a, a practical workbook for, Yes. Either astrologers could use it for their clients or people could use it for their selves if they have their birth chart. Um, so could you talk a little bit about how the book can be used in that sense? Yes, I know it can seem astrology can seem a little daunting uh, because it's very data heavy. Right. Uh, so but but it's like so popular now and really having a, a bit of a renaissance, uh, although definitely a lot of it is pop. Uh, we're still getting a lot of these individuals that do really deep work with historical astrology are also like kind of gaining ground and people are uh, kind of imbibing more of the data, I guess. But um, so you shouldn't be intimidated. I know it's a lot of information, but you can basically just take your birth chart and then very simply, I instruct you how to make a reversal or a mirror of your personal birth chart. And then you can look up every single placement in the book. So kind of like there's a lot of astrology books where you can look up all of your placements. Uh, these would be like all the books by Robert Hand or, you know, Parker's Astrology, where you can just look up, you know, um, Sun in Sagittarius moon and aries like i'm just saying my chart uh venus and sagittarius you can look up each one of your placements by looking at the opposite placement so for example if i have sun and sagittarius i'm going to look up the shadow of that which is sun and gemini the exact 180 degree opposite point uh like what is what is your sun sign for example leo Oh, Leo, cute. So for you, your shadow then is in Aquarius. So Leo energy is very self-expressive. Like you guys are very good at putting yourself forward and being that kind of cheerleader or holder of spirit for uh, for the room, right? The ones that keep the vibes high. Uh, but the Aquarius energy requires uh, the Leo to serve uh, to serve their community or to really you know, not just go into their self creative energy, but also to serve the community in a larger way. So it does look like you're doing that through this uh, podcast, I might say, but you have to sort of balance. And then similarly, a lot of the Aquarians will tend to do 
community service and be kind of like egoless in the masses and not really uh, seek to have like a statue made of them or something. Uh, so right. they have to own their Leo shadow and really take their creations, uh, you know, with pride and have a little more uh, of that self love uh, in it for them. So that's the balance of the Leo Aquarius shadows, mm -hmm. for example. And so uh, we're trying to like, the idea is that those negative aspects we're trying to come into a middle point between like our natural expressions and the things that we're hiding. That's right. It's that integration. So in all of the alchemical texts, they show you the polarity, right? Hot, cold, male, female, dry, wet. And the point is not to that one is better than the other. It's about finding that integration point, which is always in the center of the two. So it's that meet in the middle kind of idea. And as we as we're able to come to that middle ground, what we do is we uh, diffuse the dipole and become more whole. And where like in the alchemical process, you have fire, which is the, the agent that burns away the impurities and then allows you to recombine these things. What's the fire in the astrological uh, shadow? The, sure the fire signs are you know we leo sagittarius we're totally fire signs um so that but the transmutative force i guess is more what you're asking right right is the forcing of the ego to look at what it's not that creates combustion mm. uh so because it's very uncomfortable right <laughs> So the, the fire or force that purifies is when we dissolve the self uh, concept and include more things in it, mm. kind yeah. of push it bigger. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. That's uh, and you, you say in the book, I was actually thinking about this quite a bit, quite a bit, because you mentioned in the book that this process of integrating shadows, um, which I don't think you use the term integrating, but sorry, that's what's this process of integration um that it never ends and that you it becomes like one, once you adopt this as a natural part of your life and you decide i'm going to take this on to make myself the best person i can you say it's like breathing like you just it's just going to be forever and um <laughs> <I know>. and <laughs> yeah it's and, a um, little that, daunting yeah no right. it is it is yeah. and that's it's been my experience as well um i've been at this for a long time and it's like the further you go, the more little crevices you find that are casting shadows that you didn't even know you were there. But my question is, um, if we're talking about reincarnation, like, is there an end point? Is there a point where we can get to where we've cleaned ourselves out enough? Would that be enlightenment, perhaps? It's a really good question. Uh, obviously, I don't know, but I can give my opinion or my ideas surrounding uh, that question uh, or the way that I've seen it. Uh, the way that I've seen it is that it's a spiral, right? So it goes literally in a, in a spiral that is eternal. So when we're talking about enlightenment, we're talking about eternity, so there's not an end. We so much in our culture and how we think, uh, which is very contrary to, and why I think it's important also to think about astrology is we're thinking about space and eternity in these much larger systems of time than we're going to physically experience in this incarnation, right? So that concept of reincarnation or like that, um, end point or like a goal i think eternity kind of laughs at that um <laughs> a little bit you know it's like end it's mm -hmm. it's made that way or at least i was shown for growth right so that we can continue and grow and like evolve or change uh so it's kind of included in the program that way that there isn't an end on purpose, that it has that kind of Moebius strip or that lamnus stay, the infinity loop that mm -hmm. we're going to spiral on um, kind of through eternity. So if you think like you, 
there's this kind of concept I feel like in Western spirituality that you'll just have that attainment. And then it's like, I'm done. Like, you know, like mm-hmm. now I'm enlightened and I'm all good, but that's, um, thankfully not the case because even after you reach certain, I guess we, I would call them peak experiences, right? You'll have these, these peaks and valleys, but as we get these, uh, peaks, We always think like, that's it. And, you know, we did it, but then we look and then there's like another one that's even higher. Um, So that's where the daunting thing uh, comes into play. But I think it's exciting, really. But a lot of people just want to think that they can do something and then be done, I guess. That completion, right? right? It's very, everybody, that's why we want that death. We want that ending because it's so certain and, and then we can have that certainty. We don't have to sit there and be like in wonder or we don't know or feel like fools, right? We want that certainty, that finality. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, no, I appreciate that. And it, it's a it's a question that preoccupies me a lot, honestly. Um, it's odd, like either, no matter what perspective you take, there's like things that are kind of like issues with it um but like that one i've actually had people say to me and i think this is valid um i had one particular person who said well that sounds kind of depressing he said (laughs) i he's he was like i don't want to just keep living um and he was not like a dour depressed person he's us he's somebody in my family who i respect and uh does well in his life but i think it is a valid point or like kurt vonnegut when kurt vonnegut was talking about death he said I hope there's no afterlife. I just want to sleep forever. Like, I don't want to keep doing this. Yeah. And uh, the thing is, I think there is validity to that. Like it, it the groundhog day, the groundhog day. Of right. Life. Yeah, e- exactly. Like it yeah. does get to a point where it's like, in it, just in my personal perspective, I, I think, I think we ascend to higher levels of being. Um, I don't, I personally don't think we always come back as human beings, mm-hmm. but I, yes. I could be wrong about it. But it's like the Buddhists and the bodhisattvas, you know, like you, you have the bodhisattvas who come back. Um, they could choose to escape the cycle, but they decide to come back. Um, maybe that kind of thing, but it might also be wishful thinking. Cause, cause like I said, I, I do lean a little bit towards the side. That's like, dude, I don't want to just keep coming back here forever, man. Like, damn. The samsara, the samsara of it all. It gets, it it does get depressing. I feel like when, especially when you can see, when you have moments of clarity and you can see through time, like maybe I've had quite a few, maybe some people have too, maybe yourself, where you'll look back at history and you're like, ah, it's the same thing all the time. (laughs) Like you (laughs) really have that, that existential crisis of the, the impotency of trying to really dramatically change, right? These right. these ideas of that of that big change. It uh, it makes us feel so small when we when we kind of see that samsara of it. That is this never ending wheel, right? It makes us feel it, it feels like a trap. It feels like a trap. Right. And that's where like the the people in the, the Gnostic corners of this esoteric world, that is their perspective, that this is a big trap and it's something to escape from. And it's oh, yes. it's interesting. And really, it's you can go, who knows, we're going to find out when we die, I guess. <laughs> I think we will. You know, uh, I've had some near death experiences. And what I saw was like these paths that we get to choose and they were rainbows, which is, I know really my little pony style, but <laughs> that's just how it looked in my world. So, um, there were these rainbow bridges, uh, that went to different, there was decidedly different rainbow bridge paths. Although who knows if it's a cosmic joke and they all go the same place, maybe they all go back in a circle. Um, but <laughs> it, that was definitely what it looked like to me was that there was these different rainbow bridges going to these different kind of locations, which would be kind of agreeing with what you said about the bodhisattvas and getting to choose and stuff like that. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. And uh, 
before we'll bring it right, we'll bring it back to um, your book, which is what we're supposed to be talking about. Yes, we're so naughty. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I just wanted to throw out real quick, mainly for people who maybe are really new to this process and are, are listening to us and watching us. I just want to say that my personal experience, I spent a lot of time studying Gurdjieff and like trying to think my way out of myself. And uh -huh. there is value in that. But touching upon what you were just saying, in my experience, it was when I actually started doing things like alchemy and certain meditations and all of these things in a way that makes no sense, is completely illogical and irrational. I somehow started to escape myself. Mm -hmm. However you want to frame that, if you want to. But like you were talking about those cycles that we see recurring in our lives. I did. I've started to break out of them. And it happened by actually doing stuff instead of just thinking about it. You That's know? right. Like, it's active. Uh, the techniques that I do are very active, uh, for sure. And I, I'm not the practices. I'm not going to like, you know, poo poo anybody's practices. There's all kinds of spiritual techniques. But for me and the ones that Dr. DeWolf teaches, they are discipline based. They are action. They're not imagination. Right. Like you said, it's not just, oh, I think I'm a unicorn or something like this. This is not the kind of practice that I do. These are city based practices, which are concentration based and you have to do physical stuff with it. So mm -hmm. uh, to me, I found those most helpful. And that's where I made the most pop outs. I call them where you kind of like are like, what? And you can like <laughs> break out of yourself. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's the really, um... really interesting stuff. But um, and so if you were talking to somebody who is on their spiritual path and they're they're kind of curious, um, how would you say that this book, Astrology of the Shadow Self, fits into a larger program, uh, like a larger spiritual program? How, how would you recommend somebody takes this book and uses it in their life? Sure. I feel like the the techniques provided in it fit in with multiple spiritual systems because one of the base things to perform as you embark on any spiritual technique process, whether that's meditation disciplines, yoga, you know, Christian techniques, uh, Muslim as well. The first thing is the breakdown of the ego or your sense of self and identity. So this literally provides a toolbox that's easy to access to gain in like immediate uh, blow out of that. The second thing that it does is it provides an ability to see your blind spot. So one of the main problems, uh, like with thinking yourself out of yourself, right? You can't, you can't see yourself. We have these eyeballs that look out, right? Like mm -hmm. you need a friend to tell you got a little schmutz on your face, right? So right. the blind spot situation is talked about in a lot of witchcraft and pagan, um, you know, traditions. And that's why we use divination so that you, you're not fooling yourself. We ask the divination systems like, Hey, is this like, is this true? Like, am I tripping? You know, we need mm. to have feedback. We need that feedback uh, to discern. Is this correct? Or is this incorrect? Are we like, I call it pirate eye, right? Where you can't, you can see so much out, but you can't like, look look inside right so mm. we need techniques and tools to do that and pretty much every spiritual system is going to have some kind of tool like that so i did a combination of astrology and psychology and shadow work in pagan traditions and just smushed them all into one book so i try i, I hope it saves people time and mm -hmm. kind of like advances it quicker for people no, I, I, I think the book's very um, directly useful. Um, and it's interesting, too, because you have a very like your personality comes out in the writing. It's not it's not written in a like a dry scholarly way. And yet you also get a lot of information across in a very efficient and scholarly manner. And I, I think those are two things that are kind of hard to make work at once. And I, I feel like you absolutely did it in the book. Oh, I'm so glad. Yeah, I like to play. It should be fun, right? So I like to get all the data in there because it's very important. And I'm a very source based person, you know, like I stand on the shoulders of giants and I like to talk about those giants that I stand on the shoulders of. 
groups. And I think everyone should do it more. I feel like there's kind of some trends happening where, you know, you'll see on social media, people just saying quotes that Buddha said, but they want to present it like it's them, right? That's right, kind right. of like masking or presenting the self as wise. Uh, we're seeing a lot of celebrities doing it, right? Well, they'll say just these really like spiritual statements and then they're just like perceived in a different way. And it's, uh, it's a really interesting way of shape shifting uh, that mm. I'm seeing. Like if you do like get some information from a source, it brings everybody up. If you can say like where you got that concept or her, who did you hear say that instead of trying to steal it for your brand, you know? Mm. So I really like having, uh, bibliographies, giving quotes, saying like, who has said these things and really honoring the great minds of humanity that have really spent a lot of time and labor, like thinking of this stuff, you know? So if I have gotten that from reading their material and I'm a total book nerd, so I read a lot, I'm going to include and give a shout out to the people that I'm gaining that wisdom from. Yeah, I love that. And you also in the book, speaking of the celebrities and their their yes. uh, spiritual <laughs> wisdom in the book, I I appreciate that you call out. I am a fan of new thought in general, but I I it is distorted um, in the ways that you mentioned. It's it's and Mitch Horowitz talks about this a lot in his examinations of new thought. He's like people take it too far in a way um, and they, they don't look at some of the realities of 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 life but i like that you call out in there like you specifically mention um people who are like living off of their spouses while talking about like manifesting money or like trust fund kids um talking about just manifesting money um i thought that was funny and uh yeah and and i i appreciated it because you see it a lot and i feel like you're seeing it more and more as more people are becoming interested in what could generically be called spirituality you see more and more people kind of hopping on the gravy train and um yeah it's it's, a, it's been around a long time right so right. people engaging in that behavior isn't anything new but they just have this uh, arena of social media where it's really getting amplified and escalated and uh you know so i think it just needs that integrity and that grounding down like i said like into that humility of understanding like where do these concepts come from? Like, who said this? Like, what am I talking about? Right? Like, right. can I just say this and think it's like me and put my little brand on there? I don't know. I, I feel like there really needs to be a little more integrity uh, in those places just to help us all move through it a little better. And also because people generally are very impressionable and they'll just see something on your channel and because they don't read ancient philosophy, or they don't read any of these spiritual texts, they're going to think like it's you. So I think there's also just that level of irresponsibility. Right. No, I absolutely agree. And uh, it's something I, I I like to bring up with guests a lot because I think that there's a lot of people being led into dangerous territories. Like, yes. And uh, being told to play with things that they really shouldn't be playing with and things that in the past have sent people off their rockers um, but it's like one of the it is one of my favorite things about your book is it's very clear about the shadow like you're you're very clear about like this isn't pleasant stuff like this isn't um, it's necessary, but it's not fun. It hurts. It's damaging. And uh, it's real darkness. It's like actual darkness. It's not playtime like this is this is nope. really ugly stuff that you have to face. Um yeah, I don't know. I, I, I was trying to go to a question, but I wound up, I just made but a statement. It, it is. It's, <laughs> there's real pain, you know? I feel like um, we, we can acknowledge our pain and suffering. To me, my view of suffering is that it's something that can really connect us together. But when we can't look at negative energy and pain, it becomes this isolator and a thing that causes, you know, people to really break away and then really go into further darkness uh, because there's that lack of acknowledgement or lack of feeling seen. Like if you don't feel comfortable showing when you have like some pain, it festers and then it gets mm -hmm. weird, right? And worse right. and goes subverted into the underworld. And so I think it is as unpleasant as it is to talk about our pain, 
really vital to provide safe spaces uh, for people to explore that energy so that it doesn't become swampy or stagnant or, you know, uh, so burdensome that then they act out in destructive ways, right? So uh, we all can't do everything though. So it's important to know limits and boundaries, right? And to Mm -hmm. not saying like you have to tolerate all this toxic behavior, But when it's there and happening, like people, you know, I work with people on the daily. People have family members, loved ones that are holding toxic, destructive energy. So we just really need to have better ways to engage and deal with it, especially if it's something that you can't get away from or that you experienced already. Right. Yeah, I'm I'm a veteran. So I had a lot of friends in you. Essentially, what happens overseas, a lot of people who are not ready to see their shadow, see it in a very abrupt way. And yes. they, they come away like fractured because they realize that there was something in them that they didn't know was there before. And uh, it's. But it's also not them. It's nature. Right. So they'll. Oh, right. Right. But it's true. So what happens is that is that people identify and they think it's them like they're evil. Right. Mm. And so this becomes a real cause of shame. You know, especially for people that are veterans, like suffer from this so much because they're, they're warriors. And so a warrior doesn't want to feel like it's not living up to that uh, image. Right. Mm -hmm. So if it, if it carries that shame, it becomes really difficult for the warrior, uh, I think, to integrate it. And they start to think it's some fault of theirs, uh, which is why it's important to look at shadow work on this larger transpersonal level, because it's not an individual's fault. Mm. Yeah. And it's not you. Right. Yes. Um, that, that's very, but when you say it's not you, like, then what is you? Like, like if, um, if the darkness isn't you and the light isn't you, then what is you? Yes, we're somewhere in the middle, (laughs) right? But think about it like this. We have our identity, but you are living in a physical machine right now that's doing how many things that you have no idea about? Most Mm. of the things that your body is doing, you are oblivious to or inside of you. Like we don't think of ourselves as our liver. It always makes me think of that Roman Polanski movie, The Tenant. Did you ever see that movie? Maybe, maybe. Oh, it's good. It's good. He has a lot of occult stuff in there. You'll love it. But there's a scene where he like gets drunk and he's talking to this girl and he's on a bed and he's like, if I was me, but without my head, would it be me in my head or my <laughs> head and me? Or right. if you cut off my arms, would it be my arms and me? Or would it be me and my arms and Mm. so he kind of really examined what you just said what's you right we are much larger in my opinion than what we are thinking we are Mm. and that's why doing some of these techniques that will expand our perception of what is that thing that's you like Uh, Where do you lie in relation to nature, to your body that is kind of your parents, but also not your parents, right? Right. You're your great, great grandparents, but then you're also you, but you're not, but you are, Mm -hmm. right? (laughs) And then who's you? You're some of your experiences, or is it that spark of your spirit that is the eternal thing? It's all of those things, right? Right. So we can't, yeah. Go ahead. ahead. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. I think it's a mistake to identify or to, or to, you know, poke fingers at people that say you're that one thing that you mm-hmm. did. It's very small, very small. No, I, I, for the record, I agree. But um, I, these are questions that go on my own head because I'm like, all right, if I'm so expansive and so broad, and I believe that there are other intelligences that kind of pass through us, Yes. In such a way that we can't even direct differentiate them from ourselves. But then like you start getting into weird questions about, so what does that mean for like social responsibility for like how law should be structured? How, how do I search for redemption um, for things that I've done wrong? It's like, 
for the, I agree with you, but I just I I'm always asking these questions because I run run them through in my head. I'm like, all right, but what does this mean about how I should live and like what my yep. moral responsibilities are? But how to really deal? How do you really deal? Right. Like, how do you deal with someone punching you in the face or right, exactly. murdering your family or trying to rape you? Like those are real things that we have to actually deal with. So. I'm certainly not advocating for a loss of accountability personally, mm. right? Um, so it's complicated, right? And this is why law has really arisen. I think a lot about law and I've been reading about it. And if you look at every single spiritual tradition and religion, they all start with law about like, hey, don't like screw your neighbor's wife, like pay for your stuff. Like it's pretty basic it's not even complicated morality right, right. that's presented, which is really that accountability. But there's a lot of situations where someone's going to do a destructive act and they're kind of like not accountable, right? So, or there was something that happened that was so much bigger, right? Where mm -hmm. you get into then these real moral philosophical quandaries of how we exist in the world and with nature. So I definitely feel like we must have personal accountability, but I also feel like if we can expand our understanding of why we do these terrible mm. behaviors, if we can raise our awareness that these are so much bigger than the individuals, we might have less of them happen mm. to begin with because people will become integrated. So I'm actually advocating to do this work, not to release accountability, but in order to have it dissipate in humanity, obviously it's always going to be there. We're always going to be navigating nature because we live in it, right? We live in polarity of forces, positive, negative, hot, cold. We're not going to get out of duality. There's all these right. people that talk about escaping duality. And I'm like, good luck while you're in your body, right? right, like, right. Maybe later after you die, but not going to happen right now. So we have to deal with duality. We have to deal with our emotions. We have to deal with horrible things. We have to deal with outrageous actions that people will do or animals will do or nature will do. Like it, dealing with it is definitely something that I don't have a good answer for, but I try to do it all the time. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think that's a great, honest and insightful answer. I, I appreciate it. Um, and even, uh, I just want to say this real quick, coming in the end of the hour, um, but even uh, beyond, or not beyond, below the whole spiritual craziness, it's even like, you know, um, like the Manson family, like the the brainwash thing got some of them got, like they were looked at differently because it was like they were brainwashed. But the interesting paradox about that is that it assumes that the average person is in perfect conscious control of their mind, which is <laughs> absolutely not true. Like yeah. everybody is very suggestible and a good portion of humanity is completely unconscious to their own mental processes anyway. So they basically are brainwashed anyway, but they're brainwashed by like um, TV and in, in their, their community and things like that. But it just, it creates, it, it, it's an interesting paradox and it yeah. raises a lot of questions because it gives this false idea that some people are brainwashed and everyone else is completely in control of their own minds. That's absolutely not reality. <laughs> you it's have to absolutely work really not. Hard. And what sometimes you'll be, it's absolutely not. You're a hundred percent correct. Yeah. And some people will be coerced into action through, through the threat of ostracization. Right. So right. even if you do the ho most horrible thing is that when you gain enlightenment and awareness, you can't get out of doing certain things or you'll be punished for not following the norm. We're seeing this right. all over social media as well. Either you agree with everyone who's right or you get kicked out of the, out of the group, right? Out right. of the consensus uh, for being a deviant or mm -hmm. being an outlier, right? We can't, we've really lost our ability for Socratic dialogue where we can hold space if someone isn't brainwashed and doesn't want to just listen to whatever, you know, media source is going on or has some God forbid questions about something, right? Mm -hmm. You then get coerced into following the current egregore that's leading the parade, right? Mm -hmm. So it's extremely complicated for sure. But I feel like as we raise awareness that there are these um, kind of like paradigms and egregores that are leading people 
that's going to, I think, help people get closer to their true self, to their, to their Jiminy Cricket, right. To their, to their own conscience, rather than just being these weird reflective, uh, you know, garbage spewers that a lot of people are just, you know, kind of resulting to through no fault of their own, but they're just like mirroring and aping behavior. Right. Right. It's funny you say that uh, Mark Stavish's book, Egregore is like, uh, that book was one of the most influential books I've ever read. Like I, it changed the way I see reality. But anyway, we're coming to the end of the hour, Maja. This has been a great discussion. I really appreciate it. Um, in addition to your excellent book, which I recommend everybody buys, um, do you have any other projects or anything else coming up that you'd like to share with people? Oh yeah, I do all kinds of stuff all the time. Uh, on my website, witchofthedawn.com, uh, you can find a lot of my books. I have... Before this one, I did a novel um, called 4D, which kind of explores, that. I really liked it. I'm a big sci-fi fantasy fan. So I wanted to try to put some little esoteric secrets, wink, wink, uh, <laughs> into the novel for people to enjoy. I hope people like it. And then I have tons of other books. I have one on the I Ching. I did a tarot deck. I, now I'm working on another tarot deck that should be out uh, next year. I also helped uh, Miguel Connor a little bit with his Occult Elvis book that will be out shortly. Oh, did you really? Yeah, I think I it'll just be emailed really him fun. about that. I just oh, I love Miguel. Him about that. Yeah, That's I was so in funny. his. Uh, I just saw him in Chicago. I was in Astronosis, uh, his conference, which was so delightful. Uh, Miguel is really uh, holding it down, you know. Oh, he's he's one of the true OGs, man. Like he's 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 one of the best on the scene. I, I really yeah. admire that guy. I love him. Uh, and then I also will be in Richard Metzger's uh, project, which is called the Magic Show. Uh, that's magic with a K. It's very exciting. I'm so thrilled because Richard Metzger is incredible. And he actually got the last interview uh, with Kenneth Anger before he passed away. Oh, really? So, yeah, a lot of gems uh, in the magic show. He's, I think currently he just did a Kickstarter and they got a lot of money raised. So I think they're going to be completing quite a few of the episodes. Wow, very cool. Yeah. Awesome. A lot and of fun I, stuff, yes. It sounds like, and I will, um, I will put links to all of those things you mentioned in the description for people to go check it out. And um, yeah, Maja, thank you so much. I love the book and I will, this is the first book of yours I've read so far, but I will be exploring your other works. And um, I really appreciate the time. This has been a great conversation. Well, thanks so much. It was so fun, Jeff. Thanks for having me. <laughs> awesome. All right. Have a great one, Maja. It was nice thanks, meeting you. Thanks, you too. All right.